professor. Hello, what's going on? Uh, should we actually purchase the lab manual for this class? Uh, yes. Yeah, I thought I put it in the syllabus, but I, I, I know I didn't put it in the ISBN. But yeah, you do need it for the for the lab portion of the class. Uh, do you have me for lab or you have someone else? You, Professor. Okay, yeah. Uh, and actually, everybody's supposed to be using it unless someone happened to be over here from Chesapeake, which they're not supposed to be doing, but we might add to. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you for your service, Jessica. I'm only an ROTC, sir. Okay, well, thank you for your pre-service. <laughs> I saw camos, I was like, that, that's, that's not something students wear to class anymore, unless they're doing something. <laughs> Oddly, I wore a lot of camos in high school. I was a punker, so I had camo, I had all sorts of leather and spikes and stuff like that. I used to have hair, believe it or not. This used to be a really cool flat top blue and blonde now it's just a bald top very disappointing i heard a story on npr one time this guy was riding a motorcycle in, in like in south carolina where he didn't have to wear a helmet and he like had a rack and he like skidded on his forehead and upper head for like you know 100 yards or something he lost all the skin and then the skin grew back and when it did he got his hair back so I asked my dermatologist, I told him I'd put, put my head on an angle grinder if it would grow my hair back. And he said, no, I'd do the same thing. So no, nope, it's that, that study didn't pan out. <laughs> Very disappointing. All right, we're in 242 now. Last time we talked about a little bit about uh, uh, the course, but mostly about the syllabus. I taught you a little bit about charge. I suggested you watch those videos, uh, which are very good, by the way, those MIT videos. Uh, they're kind of neat. Like you'll you'll see that when that band of graph comes on, it's basically just a rubber band around a, a lucite cylinder, and then up at the top, it's another lucite cylinder. But by rubbing against that lucite cylinder as it comes around, some of the electrons are stolen from the lucite and stick to the rubber. At least that's the uh, I don't know the electronegativity of the rubber versus the lucite, but I suspect the rubber stealing electrons. If that's the case, then electrons are in excess on the rubber band. And when the wide rubber band gets to the top lucite, uh, those that positive or excuse me that excess negative charge, there's a little screen inside of it that has little edges or tips of the screen wire sticking out. They act as little lightning rods and they jump to that little char or to that little screen like lightning rods, and then they spread themselves out over top of the Van de Graaff, uh, so that it's all one uh, constant voltage, which means the charge is distributed uniformly over it. Now that charge then can induce a charge in a metal near it. So if a neutral metal is near it, the side closest to the Van de Graaff will turn positively charged and the side farthest will turn pos uh, negatively charged. So now you've got a polarized object as a result of, uh, if it's a conductor, it's really easily conducted away. If it's an insulator, it does a slightly different process, but it's still the same thing. One end's positive, the end closest to the negative uh, Van de Graaff, the other one is negative. And then you can start to see things like, well, that'll induce another metal to get polarized like that. Now that, that metal, which might be that little bob hanging down, that's free to move because it's just hanging from a pendulum. So it's uh, positive side being near that positive side is going to make it run away and it'll bounce off the other bell and then come back and do the same thing over and again, over again. So that's sort of the, the analysis you're supposed to take part of uh, and figure out when you're watching those videos. So make sure you do check them out. Uh, I might be able to show them later in lab as well. Uh, I, I haven't been able to put them on YouTube because it's a copyright violation for me to explain it. Uh, or not for me to explain it, but for me to put the video up. So that's why I haven't made a video about that. Uh, anyways, so now we're going to get to the nitty gritty. I did show you Coulomb's law. I showed you that it's a law that is directly proportional. The force is directly proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. So I'm now going to work some uh, examples uh, consistent with that. And I'm going to do a mother of all really integral examples. I had told my other class, my other 240 class, that I'm going to probably do some more in 21 next week, but I, I'm probably not. I'm actually probably going to make two more videos and just put them on uh, 
on my YouTube channel and you guys can watch that and then ask me any questions about it that you want during class. I'm going to jump right into chapter 22 only because the other class doesn't have a Monday because of Martin Luther King Day. So uh, let's start by sharing my screen. I wrote out some examples for the other class and I'm using those same examples. So you can see uh, this when you go to look up on the videos, you can look for the other 242 class and they're going to cover the same material. So if you ever don't have yours, you can look at the uh, 242 class from last night and they'll see what uh, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. So this is three charges are located as follows. There's a 0.111 microcoulomb. Anybody recognize that numerically? What that 0.11 would be as a fraction? That's one ninth. And there's a reason I'm using that because the K in Coulomb's law is nine. It's 8.99 times 10 to the ninth. So uh, by using that, I can get rid of that nine in front. So I'm using numbers that are very specific. So now that you see it, it says three charges are located uh, such that one's at the negative 20 uh, meter mark, uh, the negative 40 millicoulomb as opposed to microcoulomb, the negative 40 millicoulomb ones at the, the origin, and Q3 is one third of a microcoulomb, and that's at positive 10 meters. And what we want to know is what is the net force expressed as a vector on the charge Q2? So example one, I'm going to say F, and I'm, I'm writing it on paper right now, but I'm not showing it to you on purpose. I want you to have enough time to see that problem and maybe draw your own diagram. Uh, this is the force on two, and that's going to be... Uh, a force on two due to one plus the force on two due to three, which you could also write as the summation from I equals one to three of F to I, where I does not equal two. Okay, so everybody see the question? Have y'all drawn your own diagram yet? Try to draw that diagram. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. and I'm gonna go to my document cam. So uh, basically what I'm saying is that forces uh, in terms of Coulomb's law are like all other forces. They just add vectorially. So you can think about the force on object two as a result of object one. And then you also have to take into account the force on object two as a result of object three. So you're just going to add those two guys and that's it. More fancily, you might say the summation from I equals one to N. So if you had N particles, in there, you would do, you know, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, all of those except for 2, 2, because obviously object 2 can't put a force on object 2, right? So that's the fancy way of saying it. Now, my diagram looks like this. I've got an x-axis. I've got a y-axis right here that's not really relevant, but it's 0 meters, and that makes it relevant. This is 10.0 meters, and this is negative 20.0 meters over here. So this is supposed to be twice as long as that. At this end, I have a charge of 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. At this point, I have a positive or a negative charge of 40.0 millicoulombs. I'm going to look back and make sure I did copy that right. 0.111 was the positive at negative 20, negative 40 at the zero, and then 0 0.333 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs here is equal to Q3. This is equal to Q1, and this is equal to Q2. Now, one thing you might notice is remember Kepler's, or excuse me, Coulomb's law says that F is equal to some constant times Q1 times Q2 over distance squared. If you're comparing this charge to this charge, you can see this one's three times larger, right? So if one of these factors went up by a factor of three, you'd expect the force to be three times as big. Similarly, it's inversely proportional to the distance squared. So that's a really big deal. This distance is two times smaller than that distance. 
but that will not affect the force by a factor of two. It'll affect the force by a factor of two squared, which is four. And in fact, it's going to be four times stronger as a result of being closer. So I expect this force on this particle to be three times four or 12 times stronger than the force here, just from the concepts of how this equation works. So now we're going to work it out. So first off, I'm going to do F21. And what we do with this is I don't put the signs in at all. Okay, I use the physics, which says like charges repel and unlike charges attract. I use those to tell me which direction the force is pointing. Okay, so I'm going to take the K, which is nine times, I could actually call it 9.0 .0 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. It's always good to at least think about the units that you're using to make sure that everything works out. I'm going to multiply that by uh, one ninth times 10 to the negative six coulombs times uh, 40 point zero times 10 to the third coulombs, negative third, excuse me. And then all that's gonna be divided by 20.0 meters squared. You can see that this is gonna result in these uh, coulombs canceling out, these meters canceling out, and you should get in fact, uh, just Newtons. The one ninth, is going to cancel out with the nine. The 10 to the ninth is going to cancel out with the 10 to the negative six and the 10 to the negative three. So in fact, all I get is 40.0 Newtons divided by 400. So that gives me 0 0.10 Newtons is my force. OK, I just made those numbers so I wouldn't have to use a calculator and rely on all that good stuff. Y'all should check my work. So I, I will do really cool things like that in my math. And then I'll say two times two is 12. So you got to watch for weird random errors or I'll just put the decimal in the wrong place like a dummy. So now if I want this as a force, I'm going to say F21 is a force. What I do is I say, OK, I want to know the force on two as a result of one. And you can see this is a negative charge. This is a positive charge. So we're experiencing an attractive force, which means this particle is being pulled this way. And that's, in fact, in a negative direction. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I, I need to get a red pen that writes uh, F21 points this way. Literally, this pen was just working. Might be running out anyways i got to back up just in case so that's the direction of that force so i'm now going to say negative 0 0.10 uh newtons i hat because remember i hat is a a vector that points in the positive x direction that's one unit long literally the, nu the number is one not one meter not one centimeter or anything like that it's just one so that's what f21 is now i'm going to do the same thing to calculate f uh two three we already predicted that it should be 12 times larger. So I suspect this is going to be 1.2. So let's work it out. I'll leave off the units this time. Nine times 10 to the ninth times, uh, in this case, we again have uh, not one ninth, but one third times 10 to the negative six. And then times 40.0 times 10 to the negative three. And then over one point. 10.0 squared. So that's going to be basically this one third is going to leave this to be three. This 10 to the negative six and 10 to the negative three is going to cancel out that nine. So ultimately what I'm going to get is uh, what? 120, three times 40. So that'd be one, two, zero Newtons divided by 100. So that in fact does give me 1.20 Newtons, which is exactly a factor of 12 bigger than that. So our hypothesis was right. The great physicist John Archibald Wheeler used to say, never solve a physics problem whose answer you don't already know. That's what we mean by that, is you should sort of have a hypothesis about what, what the size of it is, what the direction of it is before you solve it, just so you can either check your physics. So if I got that wrong, I would say, well, did I get my physics wrong or did I make a mathematical mistake? And then if you got your physics right, then you can detect a mathematical error. If you got your physics wrong, you can learn more physics. Now, this one, on the other hand, 
this is a force that is between a negative particle and a positive particle again. So it's again attractive. So that means this particle is going to point in the positive, or this force is going to point in the positive direction, and that's F23. So this force will in fact be a positive 1.20 newtons in the i hat direction. So F2, the total force, you can see that the x component is negative for this one, positive for this one. So 1.2 minus 1 point, or minus 0.1 is just positive 1.10 newtons i hat. OK. Any questions on that? So the big stuff you're supposed to learn about that was one, Coulomb's law gives us uh, the magnitude. So we don't want to put our charges in there. That can just screw things up. You don't want to put positives or negatives in there. You just want to keep them all as if they're positive. And then you use your physics, to your understanding of physics to figure out the directions. Uh, two, you also have to use your physics to figure out the actual vector direction by realizing that the force always points along the line connecting the center of charge of the two things. In this case, I called them particles, which means they're infinitesimally small. So their coordinate is their center of charge. Does that make sense to everyone? So now we can do example two, which actually is just jumping right off of the same example. Let me share my screen again. So in this example, I want you to assume we're doing problem one above, but in the first part, I'm just gonna say only Q1 and Q2 exist. So in other words, for part A, only this one and this one exist. And I wanna find the field at Q1 due to Q2. So part A, I wanna see, find the electric field at, uh, at one due to two. Now, this is a different wording. Notice I said field. That means I've got to introduce a concept to you. Uh, part B, I'm wanting to pretend only two and three exist. And I want to calculate the field at three due to two. And then I'm supposed to use F equals uh, QE to calculate the force, OK? Uh, and then uh, I use Coulomb's law, which oddly enough, I've already done to figure out it from above. OK, so that's really the problem here. Uh, we're using the same diagram and example, uh, for example. So this should help you. So you can see we're just doing these two guys, but we're doing this concept of a field. So here's the problem. Let me stop for a second and let you look at me. So you can think of uh, Coulomb's law like they did gravity. And uh, Newton was bothered by this when he discovered his uh, law for gravity, but he knew he couldn't do anything about it. And he knew that he could actually do some really productive work with it. So he just stuck with it and ignored the fact that it was this big glaring hole in the idea that somehow we've got the sun at the center of our solar system reaching out over uh, 186,000 miles, or excuse me, thousand million miles uh, pulling on the earth with no physical connection whatsoever, right? That's called action at a distance and it bothers everybody, okay? And then in the 1830s through 1860s, uh, Maxwell, uh, Faraday, Cool, uh, not Coulomb, Cavendish and various other people, Volta, all these people were worrying about the same thing about Coulomb's law. And in fact, Faraday suggested the existence of some sort of aura around a charge and then that aura is what the other charge would actually interact with so we basically said let's pretend there exists something called a field okay so you know this from star wars and star trek and uh harry potter and they you know put a invisibility cloak around you that's essentially a, a field or uh, a force field around you that is a field and what we mean by field is you assign to every point in space every xyz coordinate in space has a quantity associated with it. So if somehow I was able to uh, at least put a large number of 
XYZs inside this room and record the temperature at each one of them, then I'd have this sort of table that acts as a function where I put in XYZ and out spits the temperature. That's what a field is, is you put in XYZ and it spits out a thing. In this case, we're talking about electric field, which is a vector quantity. So if you put in an XYZ, out pops a uh, force per coulomb that comes out. So that's what a field is. It's an assignment of some value to each point in some part of space. So we're going to do that. And what we do is we say, OK, let's imagine that one of the charges, instead of looking at Q1 and Q2 as equal players, let's don't do that. Let's think of Q1, say, as the source of an electric field. And then we're going to say, well, then Q2 will be the thing experiencing the electric field. So we need to imagine what, what Q1 does irrespective of Q2. So in doing that, here's how we did it. I'm going to turn on my document cam again. So what we're doing is we're going from this where Q1 and Q2 are two similar players, we're redefining it such that Q1 and Q2 have different scenarios. For instance, Q1, I'm trying to get this focused better, but it's not doing it very well. Let's see if I can do it this way. That looks a little better. Okay, so instead of treating Q1 and Q2 as being on equal footings, I'm going to say there's a charge here, Q, and then there's a charge over here, little q. And this one's the source of the electric field. And this one feels the E field. So how do I take out the part that this thing contributed from the force? Well, I just divide it out. So we'd say, well, E, and I'm going to leave a big space here for a reason, equals basically the force divided by the little q. In other words, if I get rid of the little q, now I'll have something in units of newtons per coulomb because before it was Newton's period, and that was multiplying by coulombs times coulombs. So now it's going to be Newtons per coulomb. And this is going to create a field. Well, the problem is, in reality, there's a field created by this guy as well. The Q creates a field. So in practice, what you do is have to take the limit of this as Q approaches zero. But in reality, the formula is still F is equal to Q times E. So these are our new equations. And they give us, in fact, a new Coulomb's law. And the new Coulomb's law is E is equal to KQ over, you can still use D squared or R squared. I'm going to use R squared, where R is the distance from Q to the point in question. So this gives you E as a, a function of position. This literally gives you a field. You're supposed to put in a coordinate, a distance R away, and it'll spit out the actual Newtons per Coulomb that you're going to experience. So that's, that's the way we dealt with it. And lo and behold, when we followed out the work, it turned out that this E was something you could actually measure as well. And you could use that. And in fact, it turned out to have properties that uh, we predicted. And therefore, it seemed to be something that actually existed. So that's what we're going with now is we're imagining it is an electric field and we're using this formula instead. So when I want to do the electric field at one due to two, I'm really calculating the electric field at particle one with now any use of particle one though, but the electric field there as a result of this guy. So let's do that. So the electric field E12, is equal to nine times 10 to the ninth. Again, you know that's Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, but now I'm only going to multiply by one Coulomb, but I'm going to divide by two meters or by meter squared. So I'm going to get a Newton per Coulomb. So in this case, notice I don't take the sign. I'm just going to write it 40.0 times 10 to the negative three. And then I'm going to divide that by, uh, in this case, 20.0 
squared, which is 400. So now this 10 to the negative third just makes this 10 to the sixth. And I now have nine times 10 to the six times 40 over 400. And that turns out to be in Newtons per Coulomb. So uh, this is basically just point 0.1. So in fact, I'm going to call this 9 uh, times 10 to the fifth. So the electric field E12 is actually equal to 9 times 10 to the fifth Newtons per Coulomb. Now, the direction of the electric field is defined as the direction that a positive charge, charge would be compelled to go. So we're again thinking of the electric field caused by this guy, okay? But at this location, this is a negative charge. So a positive charge would be attracted to it. Therefore, we're gonna say that this electric field would actually point this way. I should have drawn that green for some reason I chose to draw it red okay the electric field at this point due to the charge two is actually equal to e one two that way does that make sense this negative charge looks like a hole to it you think of negatives as holes and positives as spikes on the top of a mountain this would be the bottom of a drain for instance so positive charges tend to go down the hole so they're going to go that way. So I'm going to say E12 is in fact equal to positive nine times 10 to the fifth Newtons per Coulomb in the I hat direction. So all I had to do is add a plus and put an I hat and I didn't even have to add the plus. So that's part A. Now part B, I want to know E32. Or do I, let's, let's read the question again, make sure I copied that correctly. So part B, it says, uh, if only Q2 and Q3 existed, what would be the electric field at Q3 due to Q2? Yes, that's cool. Okay, so that's E32, the electric field at Q3 due to Q2. So yeah, that's three sub two or sub three two. So I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm going to erase the vector symbol right now and just calculate the magnitude. And again, we get nine times 10 to the ninth. Again, this is due to two. So I'm gonna get 40.0 times 10 to the negative three. And then this time I'm gonna divide by 10.0 squared. So I'm now gonna get this canceling out with this leaving nine times 10 to the six. And then this would be, in fact, uh, 40 divided by 100. So that's 0.4. So 0.4 times uh, 9 times 10 to the 6th. The, the 10th part would be 9 times 10 to the 5th. And then the 4 times that would be uh, 3.6. Times 10 to the 5th. Newtons per Coulomb. So you might want to check my math on that. I'm going to do it real quick just to make sure. That's what but I got. You did get the same thing? That makes me feel good. Yes, sir. Yep, 3.6 times to the 6. Ah. Not 10 to the 6, not 10 to the 5th. There you go. So that's our uh, new answer now, okay? And that is actually just the magnitude. So now I want to say, what is E32 vector symbol? Well, this particle is positive. So if I go back up to the top, this particle is positive and we're wanting to know the electric field on it due to the other one. Well, the other one is actually negative. So it's being attracted that way. So in this case, the electric field is actually acting in the negative direction. And this is E on three due to two. Okay, so we're gonna record this as negative 
3.6 times 10 to the 6 newtons per coulomb. I swear I thought that should have been 10 to the 5th. 9 times 10 to the 9th. 10 to the negative 3 divided by 100. I guess that's right. Okay, so here's the answer for part B. Now what we want to do is, according to part C, I want to actually calculate, it says, use F equals QE to compute F23. In other words, the force on two due to three. So part C, F23 is equal to, now what we have is the force on two due to three. Uh, that should be an electric field caused by two. And in fact, it should actually be the negative of F32. Uh, no, I had two, three before, so that's okay. F on, let me read it again. F23, the force on two due to three. Okay, so the force on two due to three, that can't be right. I don't want that. I want the force on three due to two. Yeah, I'm gonna, let's change this uh, subscript from two, three to three, two. I really liked it though, because it matched the other one. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I could do it either way. It's not, I'm just quibbling here. Remember Newton's third law says that the force on two due to three is just a negative of the force on three due to two. Uh, so it's not really that, that big of a deal what it is. Uh, but since I asked specifically for the force on two due to three, what I have to do is actually calculate the electric field due to three instead of due to two. So I don't want to do that. So I am going to change this two, three to three, two. And we'll just use We'll just use that. So I'm going to say instead of that, I'm going to say F32. Now that's going to be, we already calculated the field due to two. So that was the electric field uh, on three due to two. So all I got to do is multiply the field by the, the charge that's experiencing it, which in this case would be Q2. Does that make sense to everyone? And since I have a vector quantity for the electric field, I can go ahead and do vector multiplication by a scalar. So the Q2 we know is the, uh, no, I needed a Q3, sorry about that. Because remember we already calculated with the two in there, so I need the three here. So yeah, the force on three due to two. So I need to put in a Q3 there. Does everybody follow that? That's the one that's experiencing the force. So the Q3 is uh, 0 0.333 times 10 to the negative six coulombs times E32, which is negative 3.6 times 10 to the six uh, Newtons per coulomb. And that's actually in the I hat direction, which I seem to have uh, negative I hat direction, which I seem to have not written that there. I said it when I boxed it off, but for some reason I never wrote it. So you can see when you multiply this, this is basically one third times 10 to the negative six. That 10 to the negative six is going to cancel out with that 10 to the positive six. And then one third times 3.6 is just going to be 1.2. So I get negative 1.2 Newtons I hat. Okay. Now we happen to have already worked out the force on two due to three, which should be the negative of this. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we got, 1.2. So we've now shown with Coulomb's law as well, that that's exactly the same answer we got the, the other way. Does that make sense to everyone? Good deal. All right, so that's what you got to learn is you've got to be able to use this formula, compute a magnitude, and then you got to use your understanding of like charges repel and unlike charges attract to define a direction. And then you got to use the geometry to actually make vectors. These were very simple one dimensional vectors. So it's just a matter of using a plus or minus sign, right? But we got to do more robust things than that, just like we had to do with gravity. So now I'm going to give you an example of a more robust thing. Uh, this time it's going to be a three-dimensional or at least two-dimensional object. So uh, actually, 
I just realized y'all were not looking at that. You were looking at the problem. Let me stop sharing the screen real quick. Okay. So what I did was I took that E32 that I just calculated. I multiplied it by charge three, Q3. And I used it in vector form. So that's negative 3.6 times 10 to the 6 I hat. So when I multiply a scalar times a vector, all I do is multiply the magnitudes and the units and then leave the little vector by itself uh, alone. So one third times negative 3.6 would be negative 1.2. And then the Newtons per Coulomb times a Coulomb just gave me a Newton and an I hat. And what I said with part C is they wanted us to compare that to what we got using Coulomb's law. Well, we don't have F32 by Coulomb's law, but we have F23 by Coulomb's law right there. According to Newton's third law, F23 is just the negative of F32. And lo and behold, you can see that that's exactly the negative of this. So yeah, we did confirm it with Coulomb's law that it was solved as well. Sorry, I, I, I didn't realize I still had it on the problem when I was explaining this part. So I just want to make sure everybody can see that. Is it too digitized for you guys to see all this stuff or is it looking pretty good? It's okay. Okay. Now remember the uh, the document will go up. I'll probably do it right after class. Uh, the document will go up on Google Docs, but then uh, the video might not come up till later tonight. All right. Now the next problem. Let's go back to sharing my screen again. So this problem is a little more uh, big. It's a charge of negative 0.111 nanocoulombs is at the origin of an XY coordinate system. And a charge of positive 0.111 nanocoulombs is at 6.00 meters down the X axis, but still on the X axis. And what it wants to know in part one is what is the electric field at P sub C, that's a point, it's just a symbol I used for a point that is in fact, three meters along the x-axis and then go up four meters parallel to the y-axis. So it's literally dead center above uh, those two charges since they're six meters apart. And then B, what is it directly over the one at the origin, but four meters above? Okay, I might not even do that part. I would probably leave that to you. Uh, but go ahead and draw your diagram and I'm going to draw mine and then hopefully you and I will have the same diagrams. But that's a big part of physics is being able to read a problem and make a diagram out of it. So I would like you to try it while I'm doing it and then I'll show you mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm still in like third grade here. That's, that's, that's my humor, I'm chronically stuck in third grade. Okay, so this is gonna be what I call Q1. And I'm gonna say Q1 is equal to negative 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative nine, nano is 10 to the negative nine. I'll go over here, that's Okay, so I've got my diagram drawn. Let's see if y'all got the same thing. So you should have the negative charge here. Notice it has the exact same magnitude as the positive charge over here. That's because it's what's called an electric dipole. Your book does a problem like this, but I'm doing it differently as you'll see. Uh, in fact, I use entirely different numbers, orientations and stuff like that. Uh, but this is an electric dipole. Whenever you have two opposite charges, separated by some uh, finite distance, there's a thing called an electric dipole, and there's even something called electric dipole moment, uh, which we uh, cover, you'll see in the end of the book, uh, or in the end of the chapter. So right here, we're looking at this, and we want to know for part one, what's the electric field right here, and then part two, what's the electric field right here? So what I have to realize is, remember, the electric field points in the direction that a positive charge would would want 
uh, to go as a result of the other charge. So that's going to give me a direction. What I'm going to see here is I'm going to see, okay, well, I go over three and then up four. So this is clearly a three, four, five triangle. And the three, four, five triangle It turns out that in the three, four, five triangle, this uh, angle right here is 53.1 degrees. And this is like 36.9. So that's something that'll help us in other words, okay? And that tells us, of course, the distance between these is exactly five meters. So that's kind of nice as well. So what I, what I realize is that the line connecting the point and the line connecting the charge is the line along which the electric field acts by Coulomb's law. And then I just got to say, well, this is a negative charge. So if I put a positive charge there, it would be compelled to go that way because that's, at, and since that's the definition of an electric field direction, then clearly the electric field direction points that way. So I can draw the electric field vector right here like that okay so this is the electric field at c due to one and i'm going to then do the electric field at c due to two and then i'll add them and what we'll find is that e at c is equal to e at c due to one plus e at c due to two so we now have that and I'm just going to use the formula to work out the actual magnitude. So I'll say the electric field at C due to one is equal to nine times 10 to the ninth. I'm leaving off the units again. I'm going to multiply that by the charge. Notice I don't put in the sign here. 0 0.111 times 10 to the negative ninth. That's really super because this cancels out with that and this cancels out completely with that. And then all that is divided by 5.00 meters squared. Again, I said I wasn't using the unit, so I'll erase that. Uh, this gives me one for the top and then divided by 25. One divided by 25, you know, if you multiply that by four over four, you get four over 100. So this is 0 0.040 uh, Newtons per Coulomb. That's the magnitude. All right, now what we can see is we can see that in fact, the Y component of this is negative and points from here to here. So you're imagining going from the tail of the vector to the head of the vector. So here's the tail, here's the head, but only going along the X and Y directions. So if I go here first in the Y direction, I have to go down. Then I have to go in the x direction, which is to the left. So that's a negative as well. So I see now that these two components, the y component and the x component, are both negative. And in fact, this one, EC1 sub x, is equal to 0 0.04 newtons per coulomb times the cosine of 36.9 degrees. Similarly, this one is EC1Y, and I have to force a negative there, and I have to force a negative here, too. This one's going to be 0 0.04 newtons per coulomb times the sine of 36.9. So my answers for the X component is going to be ec one sub x is equal to negative 0 0.04 newtons per coulomb. I'll put an extra zero there. And then I can tell that the cosine of 36.9, remember that's this angle up here. The cosine of it is four fifths. And of course, 0 0.04 divided by five is 0 0.008. And then I multiply that by four and I get 0 
Okay. So I'm going to check my work on that. Because, you know, I told you I can do some magical mathematics and then I'll divide by 10 and get a screwed up answer because I'm a dummy. I got 0 0.024 when I did the uh, cosine of 53.1 times. Ah. Uh, yeah, if you did cosine of 53.1, you're actually getting the uh, you're getting the Y component. I mean, the X component, not the O. Oh, that's Y. I labeled this X, didn't I? Thank you. Uh, notice, <laughs> notice if you label it wrong because you're drunk or something. I don't know. <laughs> then you're going to get the wrong answer. Why did I say that was the X component? This is the X component here. And this is the Y component here. Uh, thank you. You're exactly right. And then uh, in this case, the uh, what I was calculating was supposed to be the X component, which should have been sine of... Thanks for catching that. Who, whoever that was, who was that? Uh, me. Okay, thanks, Colby. I thought that was you. You sound like your voice. Was your brother my student last semester or something? Or were you? No, you were my student last that semester. That was me. Yeah, that's what it was. You looked a little different the first day you logged in. I was like, I wonder if that's his brother. And then I realized, no, you were in 241 last semester. So, okay, uh, now we're going to have 0 0.040. Uh, times and now what I want to do is the cosine of 36.9 uh, to get the uh, excuse me the sine of 36.9 to get me the x component so the sine of 36.9 is three fifths which you're exactly right it comes out to be 25 instead of 30 so 0 0.04 divided by 5 is 0 0.008 and then I multiply 0 0.008 times three and I get 0 0.024. I think you said two five, uh, I meant two four. Is that what you said you got like two three nine nine or something like that? I just said two four, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I'll double check my math on that and that should be 0 0.04 times sine 36.9, and yeah, that gives me 0 0.024, yes. Okay, last time I did it, I actually had the decimal light right against the two, so I wanted to make sure I didn't make that mistake. So I made a whole other mistake instead. <laughs> so EC1Y would be, again, that one's gonna be a negative component of what as well. This is where I forced myself to write the negative. And then I gotta multiply it times the cosine of 36.9, cosine of 36.9 is four fifths. So the same thing happens this time, the 0.04 divided by five becomes 0 0.008. And then when I mul multiply 0 0.008 by four, I get 0 0.030. So this is gonna be negative 0 0.030 Newtons per Coulomb. So I now have that uh, Y component as well. Now I gotta do the same thing for, for the electric field at C due to two. So I'm gonna draw this hypotenuse and realize that this is another three, four, five triangle, of course. But in this case, notice this is a positive charge. So uh, it's gonna be repelled from it. So you actually expect this electric field to point this way. So this is E, C due to two. And you can see in that case, we're going to have a negative X component, but a positive Y component. And this guy over here would be E, C, 2, sub X. Okay. Now, in this case, this angle is the 53.1. So that's the same as this angle, 53.1 degrees. So if you notice, this is five meters away. This has the same magnitude as that charge. So it should be exactly the same electric field strength. So E, C, 2, it's just going to equal 0 0.040 newtons per coulomb. That means EC2x 
should be, again, I'm going to force a negative, 0 0.040 newtons per coulomb times the cosine of 53.1 degrees. And of course, that's going to give me a negative. The cosine of 53.1 is 3 fifths. So that's going to give me that 0 0.024. And then EC2Y is, is actually positive 0.04 newtons per coulomb times the sine of 53.1 degrees. That's going to give me a positive. Now, the, the sine of 53.1 uh, is again this one, so that'd be four fifths, and that's 0 0.008 times four, which is uh, three, is, excuse me, eight times 0 0.004 sine of this. Double check, sine 53.1, that should be, yeah, that should be four fifths. This one was three fifths, so yeah, that should be, was it three or? Yeah. Oh, three was two, four. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and this one should be 0 0.030 newtons per coulomb. Okay, sorry about that. I just was having a brain freeze, but it was because I kept looking at the wrong number. I was knowing I should get this, but I kept looking at this as that answer, and it was screwing me up. Or excuse me, this is that answer, and it kept screwing me up. All right, so what we see now is that E... C is equal to E C one plus E C two. I think you can see what happens. E C one X and E C two X add up to give you twice as big a number. So it's negative 0 0.048 Newtons per Coulomb in the I hat direction. Okay. And then EC1Y is negative and EC2Y is positive and they're the same quantity, so I get zero. So that's actually the net electric field. And you sort of expect that from the symmetry because notice these are identical in magnitude. And since they're identical in magnitude, they should have the same X and Y components, but this one's a positive and that one's a negative. So yeah, they do cancel out. So the net effect is you just get a electric field pointing that way directly over the center of a dipole. Any questions on that? We're going to actually define the dipole moment as a vector P and it's going to be Q D. Uh, and what it is is basically the electric field uh, that should be created from this should point this way. So they're going to define the D vector to point the opposite way. So D vector goes from negative to positive. And that's the quantity called the dipole moment. And we use that a lot. Your book talks about it. But it turns out like when you calculate energy or torque on it, the torque is just uh, uh, P cross E, just like R cross F was the torque in last semester. Now we're going to do P cross E, the electric field, and the potential energy is just P dot U, or excuse me, U is just P dot E, uh, where you get the potential energy. So that's just another thing uh, for you to keep track of, but the, we'll use it from the time to time. But by creating a vector that's basically Q times D long, so it would be three meters times uh, the charge, which would be 0.11 times 10 to the negative ninth coulombs, we get this quantity, the, the dipole moment's magnitude. And then of course we call it pointing in the positive X direction. So we put an I hat, we get a vector. So. This is the actual electric field at, due to that dipole at that point, okay? The other part of the question I'm gonna skip because I got, a, uh, I got 24 minutes and I've got to do a really big problem. Uh, but the rest of it is this, you're gonna calculate now the electric field due to this particle here, which clearly the electric field here only points down. So it's only a Y component for one, but this one's gonna be now at this angle. In other words, uh, this charge is going to cause an electric field pointing that direction. 
So you'll have a different angle. This isn't going to be 53.1 now. It'll be smaller than that. It's no longer a three, four, five triangle. In fact, it's a six, four triangle with this being the square root of what? 36 plus 16. So that'd be 40, 52. So the square root of 52 would be the length here. And you just add those like that. So I'll leave that up to you. I might work it later and uh, post it online as a uh, YouTube video. Uh, I'll also uh, post a couple other uh, integral problems online, uh, and that, that'll basically finish up our chapter 20, uh, or excuse me, chapter 21. All right, somehow I got my tops all mixed up on my pens. That's going to mess me up. So, all right, the next, next problem we're going to have is going to require us to make a statement about the vector electric field. So I'm going to derive an equation, and I'm going to give you another set of equations as well, all of which are things you're allowed to put on your equation sheet. So these are the things that I told you should box off and put in bright yellow. Okay, so what we're going to start off is imagining a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. Your Cartesian coordinate system, by the way, needs to be right-handed. And what that means is I hat cross J hat better equal k hat. If it doesn't, if it equals like negative k hat, then you have a, a negative, or excuse me, a left-handed coordinate system, which you're perfectly valid in using, but all your formulas will be wrong. Everything will be off by like a negative in these weird ways. So just always make sure that you can picture this as your index finger as the x-axis, this middle finger as your y-axis, and this thumb as your z-axis using your right hand it should match that. If it doesn't, then you've got it drawn wrong, okay? Now, now that we have that, uh, what I'm gonna do is imagine a blob of matter right here that's charged. It's got some charge, say, uh, Q. What I'm gonna picture is cutting that little blob of matter into a bunch of little infinitesimal blobs of matter about that big, okay? And then I could say, well, this little DQ here, that DQ can either be written lambda times DL, where this is a, a charge per unit length. So it'd be some quantity. It might be a function or it might be a constant. Uh, but the main thing is it's going to have units of coulombs per meter. It could also be a sigma DA in which case this thing again could be a function or a constant, but it's gonna have units of coulombs per square meter, or it could be rho dV. That's not the density, the mass density that we were just talking about with water. Uh, oh, actually that was 241, sorry. That's not the mass density, that's the charge density. So it should have units of coulombs per cubic meter. Again, it could be a function or a constant. If they say it's uniformly charged, that means either lambda, sigma, or rho are constants, okay? So that's one of the formulas that I was telling you, you, cannot, uh, you won't find in your book, but you can certainly use them on your equation sheet. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do now is say, let's consider a point P over here. That's the pretty point P. I'm trying to use a fancy P there. Uh, that's the point at which I wish to know the electric field. So uh, the differential electric field due to that point is what I'm looking for. So to do this, it's really wise to create some vectors. So this is going to be the vector RP. It's a vector that points to the point P at which we wish to know the electric field. This is going to be the vector RDQ, and that vector points from the origin to the point of the DQ, the location of the differential charge element. Can anyone, by looking at this and understanding how vectors add, subtract, or cross product, can anybody tell me a vector operation you could do for these two uh, to get a line or a vector parallel to this line? Because remember, Coulomb's law says the line of force uh, will always be the line connecting the two centers of charge. Can you think of an operation between RP and RDQ that would give you uh, something parallel to that? Cross product? 
cross products is pretty close. Well, it's in some sense, you're thinking along the right lines. Uh, but remember, that makes a, a vector that's perpendicular to the plane created by this one. We need it tangential to that plane. So that's one of the operations that we can't do. Uh, Jared said, isn't it subtraction? And yes, that's exactly right. And the deal is the direction of an electric field, remember, is the direction in which a positive charge would go. If we assume DQ is positive, which we should, because if it's negative, there's going to be a negative that pops up in it. And if I put that in Coulomb's law, it's going to change the direction to the opposite. So it works perfectly if we just assume this is positive. Then if I put a positive charge there, it's going to want to go that way. So in fact, I need a vector that points from here to here this way. So is that RP minus RDQ or is that RDQ minus RDP? Anybody recall? Is it RP minus RDQ or is it RDQ minus RP? You might want to look back at those videos on the module zero where I showed you how to subtract vectors by drawing. This should be RP minus RDQ. So that vector gives us a direction along which the electric field should point. So I can now write Coulomb's law like this. I'm going to say, and I'm not going to write it in black, I mean in red, I'm going to write it in blue. So I'll say DE, the differential electric field element due to that differential charge element right here. And now I'm gonna stop using the K, okay? That K I told you that uh, on, that nobody really uses anymore. I'm gonna use the one over four pi epsilon and not instead. I'm gonna say, this is equal to DQ over four pi epsilon naught. That's the same thing as K, one over four pi epsilon naught is equal to K. Okay, and epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. So that's all you need to know about that. Now, remember it was charge times K over the distance squared. Well, the distance between them is the magnitude of this vector. So I'll put the magnitude of this vector, which is RP minus RDQ. And now I'm going to square that. But here's the problem. I need to multiply by this vector to get the direction right. So I'm going to say times RP minus RDQ. And now that gives me the right direction, but it's increased Coulomb's law value up by an amount, oops, by an amount of the magnitude RP minus DQ. So if I put squared down here, it would be too small. It'd be a one over R law. So I got to put cubed here. And that's our famous equation that's going to be super helpful. Okay. Now that we have that, I can actually work a really robust integration problem uh, for calculating an electric field. You'll see several of them on my YouTube channel. And I definitely uh, recommend you see those. And I'm going to put some more this weekend. Uh, so make sure you check those as well. I would, I would suggest you subscribe to my YouTube channel. So that way uh, you can get a notification every time I put a new video up. Uh, and maybe you'd notice like last night, I accidentally put the same video up twice. So maybe somebody <laughs> will catch me from doing that. So here's my problem. This is gonna be example uh, four. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a XY coordinate system. There's my X, there's my Y axis. And I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna call this distance Z, even though it's along the X axis, but it's a constant. And I'm gonna call this point right here, P. That's the point at which I wish to know the electric field. Now, what I'm also gonna do is I'm going to draw an infinitesimally thin wire, but I'm going to show its size so y'all understand what's going on. And this wire is going to go on for infinity that direction. And it's going to go on for infinity this direction as well. 
okay? And it's gonna be uniformly charged. So that means if I took off one centimeter of it and found out that had three microcoulombs, if I take off any other centimeter, it's gonna have three microcoulombs as well. So what that tells us is that that number, three microcoulombs per centimeter, lambda, is the differential charge element divided by the differential length, which in this case is dq over dy, okay? So what I wish to know is the electric field there. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to divvy up my uh, electric charge distribution. I'm gonna say right here is a little differential charge element dq, which is equal to lambda times dy, because in fact, this distance right here is dy. And in fact, this distance right here is y. Okay. So remember what we're using is dE is equal to dQ over four pi epsilon naught RP minus RDQ cubed times RP minus RDQ like that. And remember that RP was the vector that pointed from the origin to P and RDQ was the vector that pointed from the origin to DQ. So can anybody tell me the length of RDQ? Can you see on that diagram what the length of RDQ is? Lambda dy. Yes. Uh, oh, actually, that's the that's the length of it, but not the length of the vector that points to it. In other words, lambda dy is actually the the amount of charge that dq has, uh, but what distance is it from the origin? Just y. Exactly. And what direction does that vector point? Positive y direction. There you go. So we can now write this vector as y j hat. That's easy, right? That's literally the vector, r dq is right there. Now, can anybody tell me the length of the vector rp? Remember, it goes from the origin to the location of the point that you wish to know the electric field. Yeah, can you see, is there a value under the under the P? I, I can't really read that. It looks like, yeah, that, that value right there. Yep, Z. Okay, so it would be Z. Yes, so that is Z. And of course it points in the X direction. So all I have to write is Z I hat. And then, of course, you can also compute what the actual vector is, RP minus RDQ, is just going to be uh, this vector right here. If I could draw a straight line, it would be really helpful. That is the vector RP minus RDQ. Okay, so I think you could tell obviously the y component of that vector is negative y and the z component of that is positive z, or excuse me, the x component of that is positive z. So you'd say z i minus y j hat, but that's also what you'd get if you just computed rp minus rdq. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. So rp minus rdq is just equal to z i hat minus y j hat. I don't know why I switched to blue, but we did. I stand by my decision. <laughs> All right, so everybody has that now, right? You're seeing that's what that is. Uh, and you can probably guess pretty easily what is the magnitude of RP minus RDQ. 
these are two perpendicular directions. So it's just Pythagorean theorem, right? That's it. Now we've got all the parts of the formula. We figured out that DQ is going to be a lambda dy. We figured out what RP is, what RDQ is, and what RP minus RDQ is. So I'm going to say E is equal to the integral of DE, which I'm going to pull out uh, since this DQ is going to be lambda dy. I'm going to go ahead and pull out the lambda, which is a constant, and the 4 pi epsilon naught. So I'm going to say lambda over 4 pi epsilon naught integral dy of z i hat minus y j hat over uh, the square root, which actually I'm not even going to write it as a square root. I'm just going to write z squared plus y squared because it's the square root to the third power. So it's going to be three halves power. And technically, I'm integrating from y equals negative infinity to y equals positive infinity. Getting this is like 95% of the problem. You've done the physics right if you, if you get this far. The rest is pretty much math. OK, uh, but I'm going to show you that. So we got to and we only got like seven more minutes. So uh, even though this occurs after the dy, this is our fast and loose notation that we use in physics. I still got to integrate all that crap. OK, so one of the integrals is going to be uh, basically lambda z over 4 pi epsilon naught integral I had, I'll put it right there, dy over z squared plus y squared to the three halves. That's the first part, okay? The other part is the negative y dy times j hat. I want to do this part first, so uh, I1 is what this is going to be called. And this integrates from negative infinity to positive infinity. So what I'm going to do is use a trick. Anybody want to know, anybody want to guess what the trick is for this integral? How are we going to solve this integral? What substitution or what rule we're going to use? It's got a z squared plus y squared. So a trig substitution is a really good thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let Uh, y equals z tangent theta, then dy is equal to z secant squared theta d theta. Okay, that might not look that helpful right now, but watch what happens. So when I do that, I'm going to get lambda z i hat over 4 pi epsilon naught integral of, uh, in this case, it's going to become z, another z, so I'll put a z squared up here, times secant squared theta d theta over, now here's the cool part, z squared times 1 plus tangent squared theta. All that to the 3 halves. In other words, there was a z here because I made y equals z tangent theta. So when I squared y, this became z squared tangent squared theta. So I went ahead and factored out the z squared in front and just got this. And everybody probably knows what this quantity is. What's 1 plus tangent squared? It's the identity 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. OK, now this z squared under here, that's raised to the 3 halves power. So that 2 is going to cancel out with that 2, and I'll get z cubed in the bottom. And I got z squared up top. So really, all I'm going to be left with is a z in the bottom. So the next step is, in fact, lambda i hat over 4 pi epsilon naught z times the integral of secant squared theta d theta over, now this is secant squared to the 3 halves power. So again, that 2 is going to cancel out. 
and I'll get a secant cubed in the bottom. And I haven't adjusted the range of integration yet. I will in a second. So now I've got lambda i hat over four pi epsilon naught z. That ends up being just secant in the bottom, which is of course cosine in the top. So I'm going to go the integral of cosine theta d theta. And now I got to figure out my range of integration. Well, if you look at this, what you'd see is y is equal to z tangent theta suggests that this angle right here is theta. Because the tangent theta equals opposite, which is y, over adjacent, which is z. And that's exactly what that says. So you should be able to reason from that, that as this, uh, as we integrate up along that, that thing and go to infinity, this angle theta is going to approach 90 degrees. And then when we go to negative infinity, it's going to approach negative 90 degrees. So in fact, you can sort of treat this as negative 90 degrees to 90 degrees. Or you can realize that the cosine function is an even function. And we're integrating it over a symmetric range. So I could just put a two here and go from zero to 90. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say I did put the two there, but the two is going to cancel out with the four and leave just a two down here. So I'll say lambda i hat over two pi epsilon naught z times the integral from zero to 90 degrees of cosine theta d theta. The derivative of sine is cosine, so the integral of cosine is just plain sine. So all we have to do is take the sine as the integral and the sine. Whoa, I drew a theta in there for some reason. This eraser might be more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> so 90 degrees. So end up getting uh, lambda i hat over 2 pi epsilon naught z times Sine of 90 degrees is equal to one minus the sine of zero is equal to zero. This is sine 90 degrees. So lo and behold, uh, I1 is just equal to lambda I hat over two pi epsilon naught z. And that's gonna turn out to be the whole answer. Uh, you don't see that yet, but I'm gonna say that is the actual electric field that we're searching for and I'll box it off, but now I'm gonna show you why it is, okay? One, from a symmetry standpoint, point, the laws of physics suggest that the electric field due to that little differential charge right there points this way. But if you go to right here, negative Y, then that's gonna create an electric field that points that way. And you see, as you go, every time you get to some new height y, there's a diametrically opposed height negative y, where the y components are going to cancel one another out. So you expect the y component, which is what uh, this part of the integral is, that you expect that y component to be zero. Okay. So you can actually integrate to show it if you want, but you can also just use that symmetry principle there to see it. So that's an actual deal that you could do. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually show it to you. So I'm going to say, all right, integral two is going to be, we have a negative lambda j hat over four pi epsilon naught. That's lambda over four pi epsilon naught. The, the negative is there. Y is, an, is something that can be integrated. So I got to keep it in the integral. So I'm going to say the integral of y dy over z squared plus y squared to the three halves. That's the integral two. Okay. Sorry, I fell out the screen when I was writing it. And that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, you might not remember this, but if you have an odd function integrated over a symmetric range, then it's going to be zero. And what does the odd function mean? An odd function implies f of x gives you f of negative x equals negative f of x. An even function is 
is a function. Let's call this f sub o and this is some f sub b, such that f of negative x is equal to f of x. You can see if I replace y in here with negative y, I get a negative here and nothing changes there. So this is literally a, an odd function. The archetypal odd function is the sine function, which looks like this. And you can see if you integrate over a symmetric range, which say from here to here, this is going to cancel out with this. Actually, this is going to cancel out with this, and this one's going to cancel out with that. So you get zero. Uh, so you can conclude right from the bat that this is zero. But you could also miss that symmetry of physics, or you could miss that uh, mathematical rule, and you actually have to do it. What you do is you say let u equal z squared plus y squared, then du is equal to 2y dy. So I've already got y dy there. So uh, dy is actually one half uh, of du times y. Yeah, dy is actually one half du over y. So when I do that, I can say, all right, I can get rid of all that. I'm going to now say negative lambda uh, j hat. Notice that two makes a one half uh, down here. So when I replace the dy with one half, this is going to become eight pi epsilon zero. And I'm going to get the integral of du over u to the three halves. That's an easy integral. It happens to be uh, negative y over eight pi epsilon naught j hat happens to be uh, u to the negative three halves. You add two halves to it, that'd be u to the negative one half divided by negative one half. So basically this negative one half is gonna make this positive and make that back to a four. So I'm gonna get lambda j hat over four pi epsilon naught. And then one over x squared, or excuse me, z squared plus y squared. And we're going to take that range from y approaching negative infinity to y approaching positive infinity. And you can see from that case, y is going to be squared. It's going to go to infinity. So this is going to go to 0. And when you go to negative infinity, it's still squared. So it's going to go to 0 again. So you end up getting something times 0 minus 0 like that. So the result is 0. OK, so there are there's a, an integral problem where you're going to integrate over a little circular disk uh, that's uniformly charged. And that's the type of integral problem you should be able to do. There's another one where you're going to integrate over a whole whole disk instead of a ring. Uh, the, the ring was what I was supposed to say on that last part. Uh, you'll see those in the book, but I'm, I've actually got those on my YouTube channel. Plus, I'm going to make some more specifically. Uh, I could also suit this one up by making you integrate. Uh, maybe the charge distribution will go only up to, say, two meters this way and four meters this way. Uh, that's how I could change that problem and make it uh, a little different and assign it to you on a test. So you definitely need to know how to do these integrals. I did not give you any of this as a formula that you can put on your uh, grade, I mean, on your equation sheet. So you've got to actually do the integral if you're given this problem on a test. Uh, you all are, of course, free to go. Thanks for coming, everybody. And I will see you again on Tuesday. I will wait for the last person to leave in case you have any questions, though. Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Mm -hmm. What's, um, can you zoom in on the equation that's in the box? This one? Yes. Okay. So that's not a proper equation that's going to be like on the book or a formula sheet? Yeah, that's that's one you have to derive yourself. That's the answer. But your book doesn't give it to you as a numbered equation, as if I remember correctly, they don't. All right. Thank you, Professor. Have no a good problem. day. You too. Uh, Professor Younger? Yes. Um, I have lab with you later today, and uh -huh. um, I just wondered, are we on Zoom for that, or are we meeting in person? 
Oh yeah, we're on Zoom. I forgot to send out your Zoom link. I'll send you that uh, in a little while, but yeah, we're definitely on for that and it's gonna be in Zoom. Okay, I figured, but I just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be at the top of the page for that course, which I don't even think I made available yet. So that's my fault, I apologize. No worries, thank you, see you in a bit. All right, see ya. Yes, yes, you have any questions? Um, hey, Professor, yeah, I, I came back because I, I was looking for the Zoom for the lab. I didn't put it up yet. <laughs> oh, okay. I completely okay. forgot to do it. So that's me being a goober. I apologize. I'm, I'll, I'll do it in a second and I'll send it out as an email, but I'll also put it in the canvas part for the course. There's going to be a whole nother canvas pops up in a second. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure. Thank you. Because I, no I, I like to pull it up because, uh, yeah. you know, that, that's the, that's what I have next. I guess I, I didn't see anything. So I just want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. No problem.